Hello and welcome to a new episode of The Quill. Today, well, as you can tell from the title, we're talking about the end of the war and um, well, it, it's gonna be quite interesting in my opinion because it will set up the end of these lovely lovely season that we had where we learned a lot we basically lived through the horrors of being bombed and not knowing how to survive in a world where things just change too quickly and the mental scarring of John were absolutely so well last time we finished the war in Europe basically but uh, you know we really didn't go too much into detail as we tried to basically just uh, put Romania into perspective and what was happening at that time you know which is uh, rather unfortunate but now we're gonna talk about well the end of the war uh, where the allies were where the Russians were what the Russians wanted and how they were gonna set up the Iron Curtain of course we're gonna uh, kind of dive deep into the curtain see the countries uh, analyze a bit this and that I'm gonna show you I have a few videos of course prepared as usual usual if you're watching live or if you're watching on YouTube if you're listening to us uh, thank you very much um, but yeah, let's get into the last months of the war. Hitler basically lost drastically uh, by 1944, by the end, by spring of 1945, it was all but done, as you can see on this lovely map here. Even after they pushed back in Hungary, or tried to push back in Hungary and tried to push back in France, they failed miserably but uh, you know they failed because well the generals and Hitler himself wasn't uh, quite clear minded at this point in time and you know the Russians were throwing millions upon millions of bodies at the problem where the total army pushing back against the Nazis and pushing into Germany was around 2.5 million people and in my opinion 2.5 million people is a lot a lot of bodies to throw around and to throw at a problem and to rush uh, basically to get to Berlin so they could end the war and so Stalin could set up his little iron curtain around all these uh, countries so it, it was quite fascinating though terrifying since Russia was one of those countries that you know sacrificed the most but they sacrificed it willingly unlike of course the Jewish population or the po uh, Polish population which were you know by now we all know the atrocities and I don't think we should really stick to them and talk about them but uh, with that said of course uh, last time we also mentioned that uh, Russia wanted uh, quite a big part of Europe so they could protect themselves and basically you know uh, force have the force to fight anyone at any time without any major repercussions so that's exactly what Stalin did by 
quickly pushing uh, communist governments in Ukraine, Poland, Romania, hung Hungary, Yugoslavia, Bulgaria, Czechoslovakia and so on and so forth. But until they got there they had to get to Berlin and getting to Berlin was kind of tough because uh, the Germans were still very strong here in these three positions and they were cut off here in the very north which uh, this is where the that army stayed until uh, the end of the war which is quite fascinating in my opinion cutting uh, a big section of your ar of an army on a peninsula like that and holding them basically hostage and removed from uh, the war so uh, basically from the south we had uh, the US and the UK coming and bombing Russia here from Budapest pushing also in the south and central they were also coming uh, from this region pushing central and they weren't really giving a damn because by now uh, Germany didn't have the resources it used to have since most of its oil was coming from Hungary and Romania so with two-thirds of oil gone they couldn't uh, stand a chance and for example here in the south uh, by Croatia this little F section was quickly defeated in like two weeks and on the other side uh, the British and the French uh, quickly fought back and deterred any offensive the Germans might have had one last stand trying to, you know, regain some territory and regain uh, some resources, which they failed. So, with uh, the Russians pushing in, with, uh, you know, the Allies basically surrounding Germany, by 1945, uh, by March, it was all but done. But uh, Berlin wouldn't fall this easily, you can see it here. Berlin was a terrible, terrible place to fight both for Russians and for Germans as Germans lost over 800,000 people there, civilians and army and the Russians couldn't care less so they thrown bodies upon bodies to kind of massacre and fight to finally take over Berlin and finish the war in Europe. So with that said let me show you a beautiful video of exactly that happening of Russians getting to Berlin here and it was absolutely decimated they absolutely destroyed every piece of that city and I'm honestly in awe of the fact that there are still places that are still standing from uh, this attack of the Russians and it's really really interesting to see this massacre but at the same time for me at least it's really really fascinating seeing war actually documented because most of the time uh, war and atrocities are quickly but uh, easily hidden from the eyes of the populace but in this case since the Russians were victors and the allies were victors obviously they couldn't care less Another fascinating uh, thing was that this meant a lot for Stalin and Russians. As I said, they were trying to rush and get uh, to Berlin first and finish Berlin first before uh, any of the Allies could get here because 
it meant uh, that they could push a bit further and ask a bit more and you know have that prestigious uh, crown of we finished off the Nazis and we won the war in Europe which is exactly what happened uh, by the time Germ uh, the Allies got to the south and east of Germany Russia was well in you know Berlin and fighting and here you have the uh, flag put up on Berlin which is truly truly fascinating and basically victory declared for uh, the Allies and the Nazis war no more but of course this didn't mean the end of the war the war still had some way to go which is truly fascinating and horrible at the same time but here you can see the end of any and all uh, well Nazi Germany and the war in Europe though the number of people uh, that died though the horrifying effects of what happened in those years can still be seen today and still be felt today where you have people like Putin where, where you have you know Nazis and these buildings many of these buildings were refurbished or rebuilt and you can actually go in Berlin and look at these buildings and be like this is where it all happened it's truly truly amazing um, for example I visited uh, Budapest and Budapest still has uh, some of the same uh, old old buildings uh, that were filled with bullet holes and were rebuilt after World War II and refurbished and it's absolutely goddamn amazing to walk those streets and know that the, the, there were bullets shot at those buildings and people died there fighting Nazis and Nazis fighting Romanians and Russians and so on and so forth so yeah it, it, it's something to kind of watch this and not be astounded by the what by the history here and what was happening and what this meant next uh, for Europe and the world economies because you can you, I don't think you can discount one for the other as um, as it really had a giant impact and due to all this uh, it also meant that well we got a lot of a lot of positive things out of one of the most horrific uh, wars that we had ever had to face as humans so it was a truly truly something and the fact that we uh, we pushed you know Hitler to commit suicide the fact that uh, you know nine day was the 9th of May was victory day in Europe um, it was truly truly fascinating and I'm looking here at this timeline and I this timeline of World War II and sometimes you really can't understand why 
some things happened or how they happen it, it's truly truly absolutely fascinating and I, I still can't comprehend how fast these these months in 1945 moved so they you know just had this quick boom impact and honestly honestly so let's uh, continue with that so after the victory day my may 8th sorry 8th i meant to say 1945 of course Himmler commits suicide on may 23rd and of course you know here the the diplomatic and really really interesting stuff started to happen because you had all these mechanical little parts moving and uh, shaping the world in some parts for example it did nothing but create more chaos like um, the Middle East and Africa and of course uh, South America and in other places it consolidated power for example in the US uh, it helped the UK regain some of its boom and uh, things started to kind of move in a weird weird uh, way so le let's kind of uh, get into it as you know the united nations charter is signed in san francisco and uh, well we have a few things uh, happening and after berlin was basically decimated and the war ended let's watch another lovely lovely video with berlin month just a month later so this is the capital of berlin right uh, a month later after the bombing and after the war had ended maybe two three weeks uh, since the war ended so it, it, it's just fascinating to see look at this building it it's giant hole in it from what i assume was a cannon or a missile or something that was fired at it and you see there uh, there was this uh, very interesting sign uh, there on the column r reading uh, you are now leaving uh, the British sector and on, on the other side there's that giant picture of uh, Stalin obviously and the Russian sector so they already had uh, divided Berlin into its sweet little sectors and well we all know what came next but yeah they there you have it this is the russian side of berlin right after well the war ended in europe and it's i don't know how they thought this through why how they came to this compromise where they thought this would make sense why it would make sense it's It's truly and absolutely fascinating, in my opinion. It, it, the logic behind all these little moves and all these things that were happening with or without, uh, you know, thoughts are absolutely fascinating. Imagine splitting a capital and then a country so you could fly for example in west berlin if you were an allied but you were still surrounded by uh, what was the east berlin and east germany 
So I don't know how they thought it through and why. It just absolutely blows my mind, honestly. It's it's fascinating, but it's also cruel the way they built the, that wall afterwards and the way they kind of thought this process uh, through and it's it feels like it was exhaustion it feels like they couldn't keep fighting for example uh, Russia uh, they wouldn't want to keep fighting Russia because they were exhausted and fighting Russia if they were to continue to fight Russia would have meant a giant giant risk of continuing this war for like 10 more years or who knows what what, what the outcome would have won, uh, been because Stalin would have just chuck body after body after body after body at the problem Romanian, Hungarian, uh, Czechoslovakian, Polish, Yugoslavian body after body after body it's truly truly uh, fascinating in my opinion that somehow they thought it and they didn't think it properly uh, through at least this is how it feels standing back now so many years removed from uh, the war and it's just absolutely terrifyingly interesting in my opinion because you shape the world like billions upon billions of people were shaped by this war and you were splitting a whole continent a whole continent and then some because Russia is giant into two pieces and Jesus Christ it's just it, it was like it was like a pissing contest but or at least that's what happened after World War II it was like a pissing contest from two sides but it's truly truly mind-boggling in my opinion especially the Cold War era and everything that happened after the war ended here in Europe because the war didn't end in the Pacific uh, Japan was very much aggressive uh, continuously trying to expand at one at a few points uh, Japan was threatening Australia for example and New Zealand so they were trying to push uh, and you know conquer more and more of China and then push uh, into India and that part uh, which is again a very very uh, terif terrifying thoughts honestly if they had succeeded but but now that basically Germany was out because they were out Japan had no real allies to feed them oil, to feed them steel, to feed them anything, any kind of technology to keep it going and keep the war going. So it's, it's, well, we all know what came uh, next, but the thing is that Japan didn't just get those nukes uh, because they wanted to test on them raising cities was a thing before Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, they raised many many cities that way all throughout Europe and the world during World War II and in Japan too uh, they had done this but you know uh, Japan still didn't surrender even after that uh, which is you know terrifying honestly and 
considering the fact that uh, they had this giant giant let's see if I can find a proper map uh, of it because they weren't small at all they were really really big and here we have uh, one really interesting picture yeah perfect um, with uh, the height of expansion in, of, of Japan in 1942 so this was Japan in 1942 now imagine that uh, Japan was close to Alaska uh, Japan wanted to push into Mongolia into the rest of China and you know they already had this part here and were and a bit of uh, India so why wouldn't they push further in uh, the mainland of Asia right since they had Shanghai Hong Kong and uh, Nanking so you can imagine that they were an empire a true empire no matter what you think uh, this is an empire and of course just because uh, Germany lost that didn't mean shit to them because Japan was strong uh, uh, in air battles and uh, on sea obviously and they were really well defended and considering that uh, the fact that you know Japan beat the Soviet Union multiple times uh, here they weren't really afraid of Russia they had no reason to be afraid of Russia and why would they be afraid of Americans they've been fighting Americans since Pearl Harbor and look at this 1942 they had this m massive chunk and it took a while and the reason uh, the Americans used the bomb was because it was effective it sent a message it was something to fear and it was something that no one knew how it would affect the world right so with that said let's get into this sweet little video uh, from uh, the telegraph with the hiroshima bombing which honestly is it's just haunting to know that thousands upon thousands of people died truly something honestly oh yeah uh, this a uh, little building here this building here if you're watching uh, on twitch on or on YouTube this building um, you can still find it if you go uh, in Hiroshima by the river uh, there's this uh, what looks like a rundown building in Hiroshima with that metallic dome you can still find it today exactly as it was back then of course they cleaned around but it's a reminder of what happened uh, in 1945 and the fact that uh, the Japanese at least had the courage to keep this is truly mind-blowing because of course as many of us know people tend to be absolute cowards and hide their shame but it's so this is what an atomic bomb and the bombs we have now are far more dangerous and far more powerful than any of this and you can look at the effect it had on people 
those scars, those burns, that toxic uh, radiation is something else. And here we have the bombing of Nagasaki and we luckily also have uh, from BBC some bits of narration. So hopefully... Three days after the Hiroshima bomb, despite all the destruction, Japan still hadn't surrendered. A second bomb was made ready and Truman issued another warning. The world will note that the first atomic bomb was dropped on Hiroshima, a military base. If Japan does not surrender, bombs will have to be dropped on war industries. I urge Japanese civilians to leave industrial cities immediately and save themselves from destruction. I realize the tragic significance of the atomic bomb. Having found the atomic bomb, we have used it. We have used it against those who attack us without warning at Pearl Harbor. Oh my God, that speech is really well written and really, really haunting, honestly. If you try to put it in that uh, context. Those who have starved and beaten and executed American prisoners of war against those who have abandoned all pretense of obeying international laws of warfare. We have used it in order to shorten the agony of war, in order to save the lives of thousands and thousands of young Americans. The second bomb was intended for the city of Kokura, but it was too cloudy, so the plane moved on to Nagasaki. Desperately short of fuel, the crew released the bomb despite more clouds. The bomb missed the aiming point and fell into a valley. This time there was no firestorm, but even so, more than 50,000 people were killed. The Supreme War Direction Council in Tokyo was meeting on the same day. By now, the Russians had declared war on Japan. Then came the news from Nagasaki. I forgot the, uh, that uh, they do reenactments and for those that don't know Japanese uh, and are listening to the audio version, uh, I'm gonna Beating on the give same you day. Uh, By now, the Russians have declared war saying. on Japan. Uh, I don't know Japanese that well. Let me preface this. It's just that they have subtitles. Then came the news <laughs> from Nagasaki. There is only one thing we need to establish, and that is the survival of the emperor, emperor system. I agree. We should contact the Americans immediately and make plans, uh, make plain our position. Nothing has changed. We must insist on the terms we always thought necessary. So this is what I was saying before, where the Japanese didn't really have to fear anyone because they were beating uh, China to pulp and India and uh, Russia, and they were in a stalemate with the Americans. So who exactly was a threat to them, you know? The Empire system must survive. The Americans cannot occupy the home island. Nor can they try to so... Can they try uh, so-called... We must be allowed to manage the disarming of the Navy and Army ourselves. But they will never accept these terms. Then 
then they will risk the cost of invasion. See, they... Ah. Now we have uh, over 3 million soldiers ready to fight. And 500,000 planes to attack their troops off the coast of Kyushu. We can even use our training aircraft as specialized kamikaze attack planes. They will uh, worry of the slaughter. If we expand our forces, fighting uh, the first assault will be completely help helpless. So again, the Japanese didn't give really a shit uh, about what was about to happen, even after <laughs> Two atom bombs in four days, two whole cities obliterated. <laughs> Then next we fall on Tokyo. We must wait uh, for the result of our investigations before we can be certain they are atomic bombs. Bomb on Tokyo could destroy the Imperial family. There would be panic on the streets. It's unthinkable. A true soldier would rather die than surrender. Then Prime Minister Suzuki did something unheard of. He asked the Emperor to break the deadlock and make a decision. Emperor Hirohito told them he wanted to end the suffering and bear the unbearable. Four days later, radical soldiers attempted a coup to prevent the surrender. They failed. At dawn on the day that Emperor Hirohito was to broadcast an announcement to the Japanese people that the war was over, General Anami prepared to end his life in the time-honored tradition of seppuku. <laughs> His suicide note read, My death is my apology for my great crime. And there you have it. This is kind of what happened uh, at the end of World War II and ending World War II, actually, which is rather interesting and both terrifying, in my opinion, because well because a lot of people died and you know it's i can't really understand why or how this was allowed to happen for so long and but it, it's it's terrifying because for example here you have a fractions of various countries population that died in world war ii and you have belarus with uh, 2.29 million people you have poland with 5.82 ukraine 6.85 now you put ukraine belarus and the rest of ussr which is 16.825 million together and it's mind-blowing it's mind-blowing how m many people they just killed off and they didn't give a shit. Uh, Latvia, 260,000. Lithuania, 375,000. Germany, 9 million. Japan, 3 million, oh, 120,000. Uh, China, 20 million. China, 20 million, just like that. And those 20 million that died, died fighting Japanese. So, if you're also wondering if Japan deserved uh, two atom bombs, you should look at that 20 million killed uh, there. Because that's basically it. 
Um, then you had France with uh, 550,000 people, Italy with 454,600 people, UK with uh, 45,900, Canada with uh, 100,000, I meant to say 100,000 uh, to France, Italy and United Kingdom if I didn't. Uh, 45,400 uh, to Canada and 42,000 uh, to the US and uh, that's kind of just a small part of it because uh, well here we have another little graph um, that basically puts them into a percentage so out of the total population of uh, that was in 1939 in these countries uh, this uh, was the percentage of people that died USA 0.3 uh, percent so 400,000 people Norway 0 0.3 so uh, 10,000 Canada 38,000 again 0 0.3 Bulgaria 20,000 0 0.3 Australia 29,000 0.4, Italy 303,000 0.7, uh, United Kingdom 386,000 0.8. Uh, these are kind of uh, estimates. Uh, Soviet Union includes also the Baltic states, um, Philippines 118,000. So 0 0.9 percent. It's uh, eight uh, with 1.1 percent and 88,000 people. Belgium, uh, Japan, 1.8 million. So 1.8 uh, percent of the people. Romania with 1.9 and 378,000 Romanians, um, which is a lot. So Romania lost a lot during the war especially if you look at percentages uh, compared to, to for example bulgaria and other countries in some of the other countries in that same region but then again you have you know france with 1.9 and 800,000 people finland 84,000 people uh, netherlands 200,000 uh, 100,000 people um, 15 million in China, so 3.5 there. Hungary, 40,000, uh, 4.57. Um, Greece, again, 406%. Germany, 7 million, 8.8. .8. Yugoslavia, 1.7, so 11%. Soviet Union, 25 million, 14.2%. And Poland, 6 million, 17.2% of their population. And honestly, that's absolutely horrifying. And to think that this was fought due to some reason, some so stupid reason, honestly, because I can't describe it any other way and well thus concludes world war ii october 24 1945 the united nations in is born november 20th nuremberg trials begin and here we are at the end of world war ii now we have an iron curtain a curtain that split germany into two pieces a curtain that allowed Stalin and the Communist Party to kill a bunch more people after the war because they were fiends, they were against the system, they were uh, bad, bad people, they were Nazis or allied, uh, you know, or other type of sympathizer which they didn't agree with even in countries like Romania where they were you know a kingdom and 
they really couldn't give a crap about communists until well, World War II and until the communists made their way in. So this is the Iron Curtain. You have NATO states with Norway, UK, Iceland, Netherlands, Belgium, Denmark, West Germany, Italy, France, Luxembourg, Portugal, Turkey and Greece. Then you have uh, those that were non-aligned like Finland, Sweden, though again uh, Finland was a participant in the war, Ireland, Spain, uh, Austria, Switzerland and the list goes on but where uh, our main focus is here in Europe then you have uh, other communist states so we talked about uh, this a few times now about Yugoslavia and uh, Albania where well you know the curtain Stalin had in mind was from Hungary you know down to Yugoslavia uh, and uh, Albania here so uh, they could push up to you know the NATO states like Greece and Turkey so they would kind of have uh, these states here in the south uh, east isolated from the rest of Europe kind of except Greece here kind of being close to you know Italy but even so I don't think that would have been a problem for Stalin and I think he would have been very pleased but to the very 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 complicated history and ethnicity problems and all those problems uh, the communists didn't really Stalin specifically didn't really get to have his way with Yugoslavia and Albania because it was very very weird so you have it here as East Germany Czechoslovakia Hungary Romania Bulgaria Poland afterwards and of course the USSR having the rest that was uh, the Iron Curtain and boy was it a weird one because even though the communists had made their way into you know most of these countries by the end of 1945 they weren't really established uh, that well even though they were pushing and pushing and pushing and pushing they wouldn't really have their way for a long time but we're uh, gonna discover that uh, with uh, the next season of the quill and here is kind of where we're gonna end today's episode because all I really wanted is to get to the end of 1945 here and show you where we are now because this is how they chose to split with the Yalta Accords you know Europe then we're gonna have 1946 we're gonna have uh, some effects of the trials and uh, some executions and a really bunch of complicated stuff happening uh, both in Romania and Europe but with that said I really appreciate uh, your view I really appreciate you watching or listening until then see you next time and just Take care because yeah. So long as the